This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Second session of the Contemporary Fiction Seminar. Uh, we're just going to send round this mailing list for the Institute of English Studies. Um, so they'll send you details not just of this seminar, all the other seminars that are going on here. Uh, details, if you want to join our mailing list, you're not already on it, you just email us at contemporaryfictionseminar at gmail.com. Um, I'm Tony Manessio and with Zara Dillon we organise the, these sessions. Just a couple of announcements before I uh, introduce our guest speaker, Will Brooker, here. Our next seminar is on December the 5th, uh, 6 to 8, in room 261, which is upstairs. And it's on Joss Whedon after Buffy. We have quite a collection of guest speakers. The details are all on here. We'd just like to add, just confirm, Dr. Mike Starr of Northampton is going to be our first speaker. Who's going to come down for that? Um, so just some sneak advance notice that we're in the process of putting together next year's lineup. Um, we have we can confirm that Professor John McLeod of Leeds University is coming down, noted post-colonialist. He's coming to speak on the post-millennial fiction of Carol uh, Phillips. Uh, we also have a session on the legacies of modernism, tentatively titled Modernist Afterlives. And I can confirm that Dr. David James of Queen Mary and Dr. Paul Marsh Russell of Kent University are speakers. We're waiting to confirm some more. And then we'll have a session on game culture, video game culture as well. We'll confirm the dates and then we'll send them round. Also, we have another collaboration with the Critical Theory Seminar, uh, which is a special session on the work of Bruno Latour. And once we get the dates and the venues, we'll circulate them. So, tonight's guest speaker is Dr. Will Brooker. Uh, he's the Director of Research in Film and Television at Kingston University, and he's recently been made editor at the Cinema Journal as well. He's published numerous books, including the excellent BFI classic on Star Wars. Uh, he's also the author, obviously, of Batman and Mars, and Analyzing a Cultural Icon, which was, I think, was originally your PhD thesis, yep. is that right? Yeah, published uh, 2001. And he's here tonight to talk about the sequel to Batman and Mars, uh, which is Hunting the Dark Knight. So we'll follow the usual format. Batman and Mars Returns. Yeah, exactly. And hopefully there'll be a three as well at some point. Yeah, there'll be a three So we'll follow the usual format. We'll speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to questions and general discussions. Uh, please help yourself to refreshments, or otherwise, maybe after we'll finish it, we'll try and finish up the wine. Thank you very much. Over to you, Will. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk specifically about Batman and adaptation, which is from the second chapter of my book, Hunting the Dark Knight. I apologise for the lighting in here. We weren't able to turn it down at all, but I hope you can be able to see the slides, because there's quite a, quite a visual element. So it's kind of an illustrated um, talk, adapted in turn from a chapter about adaptation. And it's called The Batman Matrix. There are four clear differences between Nolan's Batman films and more conventional adaptations. Firstly, the cultural hierarchies are reversed. Film may stand in a subordinate relationship to literature, but comic books are even lower down the ladder than movies. For instance, the pitch for the 1978 Superman movie had to play down its source. I should have... that's that. You know. <laughs> so the film could be cleansed of the unfavourable association that the source medium the comics carried with it. So that's Superman 1978 and a comic of the same year. Following the brief respectability of graphic novels during the 1980s and early 1990s, the comic book has long since fallen back into a cultural ghetto and the industry, as Derek Johnson has observed, is economically dwarfed by cinema. Batman, says Johnson, the best-selling comic of July 2003, sold only 146,601 so 146, issues, which compared to the box office of films is a very small number. He calls the... He, he says, this, these sales, this comparatively low sales, cause the validity of the comic book form as popular culture into serious question. And that's Batman from July 2003, Jeff Loeb and Jim Lee. Uh, Johnson goes on, while none of the multiple X-Men comic books published in 2003 regularly sold significantly more than 100,000 issues a month, 
The X2 film that same year made $85.6 million at the box office in its first weekend alone. As popular text, a clear discrepancy exists between the cultural status of comic books and their film and counterparts. While it certainly contributes to the subordination of the former at the industrial level. Donaldson explores what he called this two-pronged subordination of the comic book to more profitable media in terms of Marvel's rebranding, quote, not as a comic book publisher, but a repository of licensable superhero characters. A DC comic, Dennis O'Neill, who was editor of the Batman titles, agreed with the 2003 report that comics have become the R&D division of the entertainment industry, a hidden asset of Warner Brothers, rather than an autonomous narrative medium in its own right. Batman begins promotion as a faithful adaptation of the comic book original, as speaks out in this context. I am going to talk mostly about Batman Begins here, rather than following to <coughs> in the Dark Knight trilogy. Although a Batman film could, in theory, adapt a single specific text <coughs> along the lines of Sin City or Watchmen from 2005-2009, none of the ten Batman movies released in theatres since 1943, including film serials, have done so. Even the aborted Batman film and television prospects between Joel Schumacher's final attempt in 1997 and Christian Nolan's reboot of 2005, including two draft scripts based on Frank Miller's Year One, Veered wildly away from direct translation. Bizarrely, Miller's own script, based on Year One, with Alfred as a large middle-aged African American called Little Al, is less faithful to his original comic, original comic book than, late, than Nolan's later version. Nolan was less perversely creative with the source material than Miller, but made no attempt to adapt a particular text. There are many tales of Rachel Gould, many stories of the Scarecrow, many retellings of Thomas and Martha Wayne's murder. But that man begins as itself not a re-articulation of any single comic. Rather, it recycles from a wealth of existing material and invents new scenes and characters of his own to narrate Bruce Wayne's journey from the loss of his parents through his training of transformation to the moment when his greatest adversary, Joker, does time to call him Carl. So a film of Batman, even of Batman's origins and early career, is a quite different project from the majority of adaptations, which usually settle for the more modest task of translating one text into a different medium. For comparison, George Orwell's novel, Coming Up for Air, was first published in June 1939, about a month after Detective Comics number 27 introduced Batman to the public. For the two to be equivalent now, the story of Coming Up for Air would have to have continued in several monthly formats since, format since that date, with its protagonist George Tubby Bowling appearing in a wartime serial, that's obviously Batman in 1943, a campy TV show, 1966, Various merchandising, merchandising lines and video games, as Arkham Asylum in 2009, and a series of recent blockbuster movies. That movie 2005. Coming Up For Air, of course, on the left, remains pretty much constant, like it covers, but Coming Up For Air is not a franchise with various different spin offs. There are, of course, examples from the middle ground between these two extremes. The influence of intertextual theory on adaptation studies has prompted the recognition that many adaptations, even those ostensibly based on a single text, in fact draw to various degrees on multiple sources. Linda Hutchins, a theory of adaptation, offers a range of examples. She says, when, light, when later writers reworked for radio stage, stage and even screen, the 1940 novel 39 Steps, they often adapted Alfred Hitchcock's dark and cynical 1935 film adaptation along with the novel. So the novel and Hitchcock's adaptation. And films about Dracula today, she says, are often seen as adaptations of other earlier films, as they are of Bram Stoker's novel. Sorry, it's not, not Dracula. Hutton further suggests that many viewers will have seen Kenneth Branagh's Henry V about 1989 as much as an adaptation of Laurence Olivier's famous, famous 1944 film as one of Shakespeare's play. On a more literal level, she reminds us that Neil Jordan's The Company of Wolves, the film from 1984, is based not just on Angela Carter's story of that title, but also on two other chapters from the collection of Body Chamber. Deborah Cartmel and Emilda Wheeler have observed that, quote, it's obvious how the 1994 adaptation of Little Women pays homage to and borrows from earlier adaptations of the Louisa May Alcott novel, and that each version of Little Women on the screen tugs at cultural strings to other texts of its time. Susan Sarandon's cast in the 1994 film carries baggage from the likes of The Witches of Eastwick, 1987, and Thelma and Louise, 1991. 
1949 movie, they say, carries an intertextual reference to The Wizard of Oz. But further examples of the same trend could in include Prince of Thieves, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves from 91, which was aware of his 1938 predecessor and a number of other Robin Hoods in between. Robin Hood? Robin Hood. Kevin Costner, if you remember that, and a, a far earlier Robin Hood. And the many adaptations of Oliver Twist, which Christine Geraghty argues, find their inspiration and source as much in previous versions as in the original. Roger Sabin and Martin Barker's monograph on the mosaic of text that surrounds James Fenimore Cooper's The Last of the Mohicans also suggests the post structuralist perspective and its conclusion that, quote, our myths have become more and more like a shattered mirror, a million fragments of story glass each refracting small elements back into our lives. Sabin and Barker trace the passage of the novel through books, films, television, and comics, and confirm the idea that many later adaptations refer back to earlier versions as well as the original text. More examples. The 1959 television series of Mohicans opens with a series of shots from the 1936 film, while 1994's Hawkeye, The First Frontier, on the right there, uses clips from three different parts of Michael Mann's earlier film, The Last of the Mohicans. An even more complex level of intertextuality, Camilla Elliott's article on Tim Burton's 2010 Alice in Wonderland sees the film not as a conventional adaptation, but a compendium which, quote, adapts so much besides the Alice books. The film, she says, is a collage of references to video games, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lord of the Rings, Blackadder, The Muppets, Nigella Lawson, and Burton's own prior work. <laughs> Not much, but it doesn't include. Even films that define themselves explicitly against earlier adaptations inevitably imply a relationship with those texts. Zeffirelli's 1966 Taming of the Shrew, says Hutchin, aims to displace the earlier Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks film. Rebecca Bell Metro reports that the creative team behind Adrian Lyons' 1997 Lita, the Lita, actually looked on the Kubrick version as an example of what not to do. Chris Nolan's Batman occupies a similar relationship with Schumacher's Batman, and to a lesser, lesser extent with Burton's earlier movies, in the process of cutting ties with the previous version, these protestations of difference tend to make the earlier text more visible. But although these case studies argue convincingly that all adaptations occupy a network rather than a simple pairing, the group of little women into texts, while more extensive than that coming up for air, remains a modest and contained system compared to the vast Batman universe. Even Larsen, Mahika, and Alice in Wonderland, with their complex cultural lives, involve a central source and satellites of various sizes. Even if, as Robert Stamm argues, the meaning of that source depends on a contemporary consensus, we can still lay our hands on the core text of Alice, a book published in 1865. Batman has no such center. The first story of 1939, which someone is holding there, worth a lot of money now, is not the last word of the myth, but it's first, it's starting point, and its body of stories increases every month. For Christopher Nolan to attempt an adaptation of never-expanding mythos with no definitive urtext remains a challenge quite different from engaging with a conventional novel. While adapting prose text to cinema presents its own challenges, the process of adapting comic books to cinema poses a specific set of difficulties. John Fowles said of his novel, The French Lieutenant's Woman, that it depends on word things the camera will never photograph, and not actors ever speak. Indeed, the 20th century novel as a whole, to Fowles, has been more and more concerned with all those aspects of life and modes of feeling that can never be represented visually. R. Barton Palmer's article on the 1981 Carol Rice adaptation observes that the characteristically literary device of Fowles' intrusive narration was translated not into a voiceover, but into the more characteristically cinematic language of cross-cutting. Some aspects of the novel, any novel, says Palmer, can never be pictured or dramatised. Although adaptation from the largely visual form of comics to the screen may seem a smaller and more straightforward step than expressing word themes through shots and editing, Pascal Lefebvre's article on the, quote, and in incompatible visual ontologies of the two media lists a number of ob obstacles. Here's a longer quotation from Lefebvre. Panels were arranged on a page. Panels are static drawings, and a comic does not make noise or sound. The film is quite different. First, there is a screen frame. Second, the film images are moving and photographic. Third, the film has a soundtrack. 
These characteristic differences of the two media become enacted. It's the four adaptation problems of one, the deletion addition process, two, the unique characteristics of page layout and film screen, and three, the dilemmas of translating drawings to photography, and four, the importance of sound in film compared to the silence of comics. Various adaptations have tried in various ways to capture or at least suggest a comic book aesthetic. Dick Tracy's deliberately fat, flat colour scheme of mise-en-scene. The Hulk's <coughs> editing and framing devices of one of the Hulk films. Using a lot of uh, split screens. 300's extensive use of blue screen and digital backlight technology. While Batman begins aimed for a realist aesthetic and locates itself more in relation to the conventions of crime movie than the ultra faithful comic book translations such as Sin City and Watchmen, its paratexts attempt to bridge the gap between print and screen media. See, so with Watchmen and Sin City, there's various sites which uh, analyze, which, dip, which show, which display a panel from the comic alongside the corresponding frame from the film. And you can see how filmmakers deliberately tried to actually recreate it. Pretty successfully in the case of Rorschach and Watchmen now. Nolan is not attempting the same thing. <coughs> Finally, just as most literary adaptations of circles focus on a single text, they also, for the most part, revolt, result in a single text. The 2005 adaptation of Pride and Prejudice by Joe Wright carried its own paradigms, posters, and trailers but also a relaunch of the original novel with a new cover and a soundtrack album and a DVD Blu-ray Blu release. So there's music from the motion picture and a new novel, not a novelisation, of course it's the novel with a, <laughs> not a novelisation, is it? With a different cover. But compared to the text that's surrounded and circulated in the wake of 2005's Batman Begins, including a range of toys, a novelisation, it was a novelisation, a published screenplay, a video game, Several re released comic books, the Gotham Knight DVD, the viral marketing for the Dark Knight, and arguably the Dark Knight itself is also a kind of spin off in Batman Begins. Often, spin offs are relatively conservative and uncomplicated. So, there we have Gotham Knight, which was an animated compilation in the same style as the, um, the Animatrix, which bridged Batman Begins and the Dark Knight, in various animated styles, kind of short animated stories and a re-release of various Batman stories, plus a very bad adaptation, comic book adaptation of Batman Begins uh, in a comic book called The Movie and Other Tales of Batman. In addition to drawing a range of sources, then, the story that started in Batman Begins continued across multiple platforms and over several years. And the relationship between Nolan's cross-media attached and Batman Begins in 2005 and Dark Knight Rises in 2012 and the existing, ongoing, subsequent Batman narratives also needs to be examined. Now, the rest of this paper addresses the first two of these four key issues for reasons of time and space. The questions raised by the relative status of comic books and cinema and the challenges of adapting not a single source but a vast archive of Batman. So the reverence and respect with which the creative team behind Batman Begins treated the comic book evidence, for instance, in the press notes that paved the way for the film's release, and the DVD documentaries that framed his entry into the home, but surprisingly, the general context of comic books subordinate cultural role, and more specifically, previous Batman directors' indifference to comic book continuity and its associated fandom. Although the producer of 1989's Batman, John Peters, reportedly shaken by a Wall Street Journal article that questioned the film's financial prospects and the fact of fan disillusionment, and responded by cutting together a reassuring dark preview. Tim Burton kept his eyes stubbornly on the mainstream audience rather than the comic reading minority. He notoriously said, there might be something that's sacrilege in the movie, but I can't care about it. This is too big a budget movie to worry about what a fan of a comic would say. Burton's Batman was ultimately far more Burton than Batman, a case of director firmly in place as author, making another eerily comic film about gothic outsiders, freaks and clowns rather than humbly taking the role of scriptor in, in the Bart sense <coughs> and trying to cut, edit and stitch together a short, coherent film story from the vast tapestry of Batman, whatever Batman constitutes. But the fact that producers had to respond to fans at all seems to have nudged the balance of power and prompted a new attitude towards this minority audience. 
Ian Gordon, Mark Jankovic, and Matthew P. McAllister report that the year after Wall Street Journal's Batman scare, quote, Walt Disney Pictures made sure to preview its film Dick Tracy to comic fans at the San Diego Comic Conference. And by the 2000s, this courtship had become routine. Short, rough cut previews of films debut at comic conventions in an attempt to generate early buzz, they say, such as an 18 minute version of Constantine at the 2004 San Diego Comic Con International. In fact, 17 other comics related to films were teased there. Interestingly, it's not seen Constantine, and those are the comic it's adapted from. Uh, I mean, that is kind of sacrilege. Ironically, then they're relaunching Hell later as Constantine, so uh, the circle is complete in a bad way. But um, it's interesting that they, they trial a film which was a very, very unfaithful and bad adaptation of Keanu Reeves playing uh, a Londoner in the... So, you have to wonder if these teasers of films are kind of just a kind of token gesture towards the fan, the fan audience. Um, the authors, before I start going off on one about Constantine, the authors, that's Gordon Jankovic and McAllister, cite Sin City as a particularly reverent example of adaptation. They say it's as close to a frame-by-frame, panel-by-panel visual recreation as the comic as you can imagine. The Zack Snyder's 2000 movie of the graphic novel Watchmen arguably went further. Bob Rehack describes it as, quote, fan service with a $120 million budget. Watchmen simply takes faithfulness and fidelity to a cosmic degree, like Dr. Manhattan. <laughs> as should already be clear, Batman Begins was not a faithful adaptation, even in the limited formal sense attempted by Sin City and Watchmen. It chose not to adapt a single text, so it could not boast that it painstakingly translated the artwork and dialogue of the specific comic to a new medium. But this course of fidelity and sensitivity to the preference of comic book fans played an important role in the film's promotion. A 2005 interview with Nolan in The Guardian confirms the increasing importance and influence of fandom, particularly online, and suggests that Warner Brothers, burned by the response to Schumacher's installments, have become particularly cautious. It's a quotation from an article. First and foremost, says the article, Nolan has had to grapple with the legacy of the Joel Schumacher Batman films, the last of which Batman Robin was famously torpedoed by streams of abuse on internet fan sites. Not only did this episode alert Hollywood to the influence, baleful or otherwise, of chat room nerd, it also induced a climate of fear around the Batman movies the climate of fear around the Batman movies themselves. One attempt after another to resuscitate the profitable franchise has failed to get off the ground. By the time Nolan came to the picture around two and a half years ago, he says he was looking at blank slate. Warner Brothers, the article goes on, mindful of the Batman Robin fiasco, went to considerable lengths to keep a lid on their plans. As Nolan explains, this is Nolan, the last thing we wanted was for any early ideas to get out there and be rejected by the fans and the internet guys. <laughs> so the comic book industry may be the poor cousin of cinema in terms of cultural status and economic returns. The film producers know the common fans have a voice and a power disproportionate to their number. There may not be many of them, but they are loud and they can pick up a stink. Despite the supposed relegation of comics to the R&D department of blockbuster movies, fans are respected and courted as a small but vocal pressure group. The studio of Warner Brothers was only partially successful in its attempt at a clean reboot. Rather than assessing it on its own merits, 19 of the 27 reviews which are surveyed in my research compared Nolan's film in some way to Schumacher and Burton's Batman movies. Although the comparisons favoured Nolan, the traces of the previous Batman were still clearly visible. 19 out of 27 movies mentioned the previous Batman franchise. This notion of Batman as a palimpsest rather than a blank slate, always bearing the marks of other stories and incarnations and impossible to wipe completely clean, is central to my argument in the book. But the promotional push behind Batman Begins did result in foregrounding comic books as a key reference point of the discussion. Eleven of the reviews have mentioned Frank Miller's graphic novels and the amateur reviews on Amazon, and again I analysed about 50, uh, frequently praised Batman Begins for its close relationship to, quote, the source material. And I'll put that in quotes because you have to ask what source material, because Batman Begins is not adapted from any one story, and obviously Batman has now been going for 73 years. The idea that the 2005 Batman would mark an unprecedented return to the original, again, scare quotes, was put on the, it's not scare quotes, scare quotes, was put on the agenda by the press notes and kept there by a subsequent paratext like the DVD documentaries. The bonus features that supplement Batman Begins on DVD work hard to reassure the viewer of the film's loyalty to its source material. Even the menu is an animated comic book, Bale-like Batman, I mean a Batman which is drawn like Bale, investigating Scarecrow's lair as heavy rain cycles on the soundtrack, with clickable elements in each frame cueing individual documentary films. 
Features like this help to bridge the gap between comics and film, but clearly the idea is also to insert Bale, Nolan's Batman, into the comic book mythos by drawing a Batman that looks a bit like Bale, you can't see it very clearly. Blurring the boundaries into a smooth continuity. And the documentaries that launched from this menu replay the sense of reverence, reverence that's already evident in the press notes. Nolan modestly admits, I've always been a big fan of the character, but I'm by no means any kind of comic book expert, and explains he called in Goya his expertise. I felt I needed a writer on the project who really knew the character inside out, really knew the comic world, that's him, mid-sentence. Goya, in turn, had, quote, always wanted to write a Batman movie, David S. Goya, in a way I've been waiting my whole life for this call. Nolan smiles, I guess he's just such a big fan of the character he couldn't resist. So this set up with the writer of the lifelong fan and the director modestly deferring to the expertise could hardly be more different from Burton's professed indifference to fan opinion. Nolan, by contrast, seems deliberately and humbly to be playing down his own authorial role portraying himself more as the editor of a bat encyclopedia. Again, Nolan claims in these documentaries, David Goya and myself drew very heavily on the great history of this character, suggesting the Batman begins as a composite and condensation of the then 66-year mythos. But the visuals of the documentary tell a different story, and now the documentary starts to clarify very subtly what adaptation actually means in this case. While Nolan and Goya speak, the camera slides tightly over comic book images, exploring art looking closer. These images are cut with clips from the film to suggest a relationship of influence. I'm going to go through these. If no one is a Batman fan, you can see if you... Well, we know that one. <laughs> these are the images which are screen grabs from the documentary. It's Batman the Bat Glider, which is taken from year one. Anyone know that? I actually managed to find all of these. Anyone want to guess the artist? No, Jim Lee. Yes, Jim Lee. <laughs> it's Jim Lee from Hush. Um, Jeff Logan, Jim Lee. That one? Uh, Dark, Dark Victory. It's, um, what, Dark, did someone say Dark Halloween? No, it's Dark Victory, isn't it? It's, is it, it's Long, Long Halloween. Halloween. Well, not Dark Halloween at all, Long Halloween. <laughs> Tim Sale, so there we are. <laughs> None of us were right there, including Dr. Batman. <laughs> Dark Knight Returns. Again, the ones on the right are screen grabs from the documentary, and then the ones on the left are the original images. That one's a hard one. It's a Brian Bolland from Batman Gotham Knights. And here we are, that's um, Toshi Jim Gordon. So, the images cut with clips from the film to suggest the relationship of influence are from Frank Miller and David Matricelli's 1987 Year One. The dates here are relevant. Jeff Loeb and Jim Lee's Hush 2003, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns 1986, Tim Sale and Jeff Loeb's Long Halloween 1996, and a Brian Bolland cover from October 2002. Gary Oldman's re resemblance in the film to the Jim Gordon quote of the comic is again made clear, but the comic is narrowed down to very specific text, Miller's Year One. The source of Batman Begins is contrary to what the interview suggests, but the entire unwieldy mythos of the character from 1939 to 2005 but a far more selective tradition. This sleight of hand continues in the Fisk's final documentary. The title itself, Genesis of the Bat, suggests a look back at Batman's origins in the 30s and development to the present day, which Nolan confirms with the re reiteration of his previous speech. He said, David Goya and myself drew very heavily on the history and the mythology of Batman. There is this great, you know, 70-year history of the character. Then Dennis O'Neill, the next talking head, adjusts the time frame that reaffirms the sense of history. He says, Batman has attracted more good writers and artists over the 60 plus years than almost any other character. Who is the artist of that? Batman? Uh, Alex Ross. Ross. It's Alex Ross. Yes. Exactly. Very good. Again, the, uh, the illustrations almost subliminally sink, shrink history to a narrow window. And Neil is interviewed in front of a movie poster, which is on the right there, and a painted portrait of Batman by Alex Ross, a fan favourite since 1996's Kingdom Come. When O'Neill describes Batman as the crown jewel of the comic book world, his comment is illustrated with a 2002 cover by Brian Bolland. Again, Bolland, famous from Judge Dredd originally. Just as the Ross painting is linked visually with the movie poster, so the documentary cuts from the drawing to a similar image from Batman Begins, suggesting a direct translation from printer screen. There is no such connection because Bolland's cover to Gotham Knights number 29 shows Batman attacked by zombies. You remember the wrong zombies in Batman Begins. 
There's a crowd attack attacking Batman, but it's not, it's suggesting a direct link in adaptation which doesn't actually exist. When O'Neill first mentions Batman's 60 year heritage, we see the cover of Frank Miller and Jim Lee's All Star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder from 2005. Danny O'Neill's claim, we've, all, we've been perfecting Batman's story for 66 years, is illustrated oddly, obviously, oddly, not obviously, by a Mike Mignola cover from 1988. The documentary reaches furthest back into the archive with its brief display of O'Neill and Neil Adams' Daughter of the Demon story from June 1971, the first appearance of Rachel Ghoul which is followed swiftly by Miller and Matthew Kelly's Year One, again, and a 2003 cover from Jeff Loeb and Jim Lee's Hush. Believe me, I had to, I had to look for all these there. Uh, look long and hard. Again, in this juncture, that only the comic book pen with a finger on the pause control, I guess I'm talking about myself there, to constantly notice, this montage is accompanied by Nolan's declaration that I felt everything we were going to have to do in terms of translating the character's story onto film would have to be extremely reverent to the history of the character, and the mythology of Batman. So rather than distilling, this isn't the moment, isn't it? Rather than distilling an element, an essence of Batman from the vast, vast reservoir of stories gestured to by both O'Neill and Nolan, the visual subtext of the documentary suggests spear fishing from within a small pool. And that pool of stories in turn suggests a particular aesthetic, a particular set of authors, and a particular period. The tone, the mood, and the type of Batman that operates within this tighter framework is not a free range and diverse myth, but the more consistent and inevitably limited figure of the dark modern tradition. The time period, as we've seen, begins from not with 1939, despite the talk of respecting origins and mythology, but in 1970, when O'Neill and Adams were tasked with rebooting the character from his campy television incarnation. Bob Shrek, DC Comics Batman, would say, confirms this revisionist historical perspective with his praise for the way that Nolan and, Nolan and Goya, quote, really, really cared about the source material. They went through tons and tons of different graphic novels and comics. They definitely culled from the last 30 some odd years and they got the character. They got it. As to the writers and artists who have been perfecting and guarding the character before us implied, passing temporarily into Nolan's hands, further scenes in the documentary make their influence already suggested by the illustrations fully explicit. Again, the list is short. The interview with Paul Levitz suggests that DC Comics may have carefully selected the shape the selection process culling the canon down to key works, gently educating Nolan's crew, and drawing the boundaries around the Batman they were to adapt. As Paul Levitt's president and publisher. Levitt says, what we tried to do was provide the best resources for the filmmakers. So we went back and did everything from finding the most interesting versions of the Batman origin, the most interesting treatments of a particular villain. Here's the classic art introduced Rachel Gould. Here's the two or three best scarecrow stories that were done. And you really let the filmmakers draw their inspiration where they may. For Levitz to recommend Rachel Gould's origin is entirely sensible. As a relatively recent addition to Miss Oth in 1970, the character only has a modest library of story to his names. But Scarecrow made his first appearance in 1941. To hand over only two or three best stories from 64 years of continuity clearly involves a rigorous selection process and far less creative choice for the filmmakers than Levitz implies. Although Goya has been presented as a lifelong fan who, quote, knew the character inside out and could presumably have written that now without this heavy handed guidance, he seems perhaps with an air of self conscious apology to accept DC's restricted playing field. He says, again in an interview, there were three pieces of work or eras of Batman that were somewhat influential to Chris and I when we were working. The Long Halloween was a piece of work that influenced us. There are elements of that, Carmine Falcone, who's one of the mob bosses in Gotham. It's a very sober, serious approach to Batman, and we really like that. And then we were also influenced by some of the 1970s Batman comic books. So the task of adapting Batman in his 65-year complexity has been cut down to adapting Batman since the early 1970s, and even that archive has been whittled further to a handful of specific books by specific creators. The Long Halloween Logan Sales Maxi series from 1996-7 is joined by O'Neill's Rachel Gould tales from the 1970s, which in Goya's words opened down the Batman mythos beyond the Gotham for a broader global scope. And then by another Denny O'Neill title, The Man Who Falls from 1989, on the left there, which Nolan names as his jumping off point for the idea that Wayne travels the world, is mentored and tutored, and then returns to Gotham. The third key influence named by Goya is Miller's Year One on the right, 
with its focus on Batman's origins, its relationship between Batman and Gordon, and to quote Goya, the approach was very no-nonsense and very tough. So the three eras of Batman that Goya refers to turn out to be 1971, Neil and Holmes, 1987 to 1989, Miller and Masekele, and 1996 to 1997. So four years in total out of the 65 years then available in the character's history. So while the production materials and documentaries suggest a broad and holistic sense of the source, the entire history of Batman, this vast range is narrowed down to a manageable group of texts, a small constellation of stars, and Neil, Adams, Miller, Lowe, rather than the universe. But even in, within this group, there remains no single source. These are multiple contradictory originals of equal status, circulating on their own distinct orbits, rather than a central luminous Earth text that is satellites. So while the production notes and the documentary stress romantic notions of loyalty, reference, and fidelity, in an attempt firmly to position Nolan's Batman as distinct from Schumacher's and win the approval of the fan audience. The process of adaptation, even from a relatively small set of source texts, fits the more promiscuous post-structuralist model, with the film occupying one node in the interlinked, interlinked network, rather than a more traditional view of original and copy. Rather than the faithful pairing, the dynamic duo, implied by both film crew and the comic book creators, Batman Begins entered a matrix. Thank you. That's the book, I think, there, you know, in case you want. Thank you very much. So questions. Does anyone want to kick us off? Got a really obscure one. Okay. Good. Like How do you think Tim Burton would have handled aerosols and shark repellent? How do I think he would have handled it? I guess the sort of serious answer to that is that the fact that he didn't and he could have done tells us how he handled it in a way. <laughs> because any director of any Batman film could draw on anything that's previously been in the Batman mythos or the Batman Matrix. So in fact, he sort of did handle it by not including it. Um, how he would have handled it is probably by having like it, you know, painted black and with cobwebs on it or something. <laughs> Some sort of vampire shark, I suppose, is another answer to that question. I wouldn't put it past him. I mean, Batman Returns did have um, penguin with, with bombs on the back. Yeah. If, if you look back at Burton's films now, they're very, very stylized indeed. I mean, um, the fact that they were promoted and to an extent received a sort of dark, gritty, militaristic Batman it seems hard to believe now. In contrast to the 1960s Batman, I suppose they are, comparatively, but I mean, I maintain in the book that all these things exist on a spectrum, really. It's not like a binary between light and dark. Um, you know, if you have Nolan's film, Nolan's films also involve fantastical, almost ridiculous, absurd elements. Um, so it's not like they're kind of like the epitome of realism at all. But then you have, you know, Burton's somewhere in the middle there, Miller's somewhere there, and Schumacher's, and Adam West a bit further over. You could have something more ridiculous than Captain Adam West, I'm sure. <laughs> the future? I mean, I've, got, I've got to tell you, in my personal opinion, I've seen so much Nolanized stuff recently, the TV Arrow and so on, Skyfall, I, I, I really do want to see the things turn back. To, to, I want to see more kind of campy action films, just 
for a break from everything being Nolanized. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's like the post-Watchman period, when um, people who weren't as clever and skilled as Alan Moore tried to do like adult dark superheroes, and it turned out really, really boring and, you know, very reductive. I, I think Green Arrow on TV is, uh, is like the post-Watchman it's like it's, it's like it's like Longbow Hunter of the late 1980s in terms of a Green Arrow reboot. I would like to see things turn back towards. I'd like to see what happens if things turn back towards more playful Batman and more playful superheroes. Do you think uh, the Amazing Spider-Man and Whedon's Avengers? Do you think that those films are kind of a reaction against Nolan? Do you see much more? Is it more colourful, just much more yeah. playful, much more fun? I haven't seen the Amazing Spider-Man because it, it wasn't very well reviewed, but. Um, I think the Avengers is quite interesting from that. I mean, I think what we've got there is, is authorship, actually. I mean, it's kind of Whedon-esque more than anything else, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a characteristically and notably Whedon film. But um, Iron Man 3 seems to be very much in the style of Dark Knight. You know, Iron Man's house blows up, he loses all his money, and he <laughs> <laughs> loses his armour and so on. Like, everyone has to seem to sink to the bottom of a pit without the shirt on these days and climb up out of the pit. But you think that cycle is repeating what happened with comics? Yeah. They went dark and gritty in the 80s. And... I, I think that cycle um, endlessly repeats in comics, mm -hmm. dark to light, yeah. Well, look at X-Men. Didn't that arguably start it? I mean, that's, that's also not Nolan-esque levels, mm -hmm. but it's weighty issues. And that was as far back as 98, that would have been talking about. Yeah, I think X-Men X -Men is generally thought of as the, as the first sort of successful superhero film, well, certainly of the, of the recent a recent time, isn't it? Uh, I think I think it's generally regarded as the sort of superhero film that showed you could do superhero films in a sort of serious and successful way. Or was that was that Spider Man? Which one came first? Famous first. X Men first. Okay, then X Men. I'm not really a big Marvel. It seemed to kick off from the next wave, yeah. which has never gone away. I mean, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's right. There were smaller movies before that, like Daredevil, I think. Maybe Daredevil's afterwards. Well, that, that track, that's sort of there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of flops on. I mean, there were Spider-Man films when I was growing up. In it, it, it came. Sense. It came after a few years gap after Batman kind of blown out. Yes. Then you get X-Men. Yes. So. Um, I think that's right. I think X-Men is the start of the sort of recent series, isn't it? I, I mean, when superhero films started to become a really commercial prospect. I had a question. I don't know if you could answer it. I, I don't know. How much of a Nolan fan you are, but I'd be interested because I'm kind of toying writing a dissertation on either Batman or Christopher Nolan. Okay. Uh, maybe, I mean, both because I've been trying, I'm fascinated by Christopher Nolan um, films. Uh, how do you think these films fit into his overall oeuvre? Like style, motifs, yeah. aesthetics? Um, I think they fit in very clearly. Yeah. Are you familiar with all his other films? There's not a huge number of them. Pretty much, yeah. Um, I think they, in a very interesting way, they're sort of, they, they're an intersection. I mean, they're both an engagement with the Batman mythos, the Batman matrix, and they use that to express what is a recognisably Nolan-esque set of concerns about, you know, doubles, people changing place, you know, playing around with time, puzzles. Um, there's an awful lot, you know, there's an awful, there's an awful lot of things, like unsettled binaries, you know, um, uh, men who are locked into a kind of relationship of mutual dependency. We can say that in insomnia and memento, prestige. Mm. Um, so I think we could, they, they fit very clearly into Nolan's earth as well. You can see them as Batman films, but I, I don't think they're at all distinct from what Nolan was doing anyway. I think they're, very, they're a very interesting intersection of Batman adaptations and also Nolan doing what Nolan is clearly interested in, exploring themes that are clearly interesting. Is it possible to measure his degree of authorial power, or is that a ridiculous kind of concept? To kind of... Uh, no, well, it was a big debate at the time. Uh, it became, uh, I remember this, this kind of reading, reading between the lines, around, especially around the time of the Dark Knight, when he yeah. was a very established figure, where he was trusted. No, it was maybe after the Dark Knight, yeah. when he became like God, basically. You know, to what extent has he stamped his mark on it? Uh, is it his stamp? You know, is he... Not only can you measure it, but, uh, I do try and do that in the book, really. Um, try and measure you know, the discourses around Nolan's authorship, because around Batman Begins, it wasn't really very established. Well, I'm still reading it first, but... Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you for reading it. Then. Um, it, by the time Batman Begins, he was kind of... Um, he, he had a reputation as sort of, you know, an interesting, intelligent indie director, mm -hmm. and he was not really... Um, he, was, he, was, he was a surprising choice for Batman, for Batman Begins. 
Um, after Batman Begins, and certainly by the time of Dark Knight, he was much more established in terms of a brand. And so, yeah, his, the, the discourse around Nolan's authorship and what his authorship signifies certainly does change um, from 2005 onwards. And you can certainly measure the way he's talked about in the press and the publicity materials around the film, certainly, yeah. And he certainly, I mean, you just, in a simple way, and I do do this, you can just look at how large and whether his name figures on the, on the posters. Because it goes from not appearing at all and having the stars to having by the director of The Dark Knight and Inception. So you can establish how his brand sort of rises and becomes something which is recognisable. It just becomes a kind of author function in the book host sense, you know. It becomes a name that signifies a certain set of values and characteristics. It seems um, interesting, in, this is my last question. Um, the theme, another, I don't know if you mentioned this earlier, but a theme that I've noticed that runs through the Batman films and his earlier films is lies. Lies. The power of lies. Yeah. The battle of competing narratives or mm. the desire to keep one narrative dominant. Mm. So I wonder if you had anything to say about that. Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't say. I, I don't think that's particularly just, strong in the Dark Knight and the Dark Knight Rises. I don't think that's wrong at all. I, I just think it's like, no, you could you broaden it and you could say it's interested in identity and in history of, you know, mm. how we construct personality. And lies are certainly part of that. Um, you know, Joker telling his multiple <laughs> stories about his origin, for instance. Um, I think, yeah, I think he's interested in people telling stories about who they are, and sometimes those are true, and sometimes they're, they're not. And even in Inception, there's like a question about, you know, whether people are lying about their past, also in Memento. The lies that we tell ourselves to construct our own sense of identity. You know, sometimes his characters' personalities are all constructed carefully constructed and they can fall down, you know, like with the, the toppling of a top at the end of the end of inception. Yeah. So the um, <coughs> the fragility of identity, I think. Yeah, sure. And lies are certainly part of that. Well I'm not chair, I'm not chair of this. <laughs> uh, is it uh, just following on from authorship, how much of it would be um down to the big boy, because I know you wrote scripts of blending yeah. yeah. Collateral and the style of the film is very much. Um, True, it's a good point. It's a good point. It's a good point. It's a good point. It's a, it's a point I don't really address. Uh, perhaps as much as I should, because I'm really looking over more than Goya. I mean, what can I say apart from in every book, in every research piece of research, there's room for someone else to come and do something which is which the author neglected, and that's true here. I don't really talk about Goya very much. Uh, I have seen those films, but I'm mostly looking at the discourses around Nolan. But you're absolutely right, someone can take that so, Was it a studio decision to bring Did he mm -hmm. work? He and Nolan are friends, aren't they? Yeah. See, the thing is, partly I don't know, because what they say on these documentaries is not always at all true. Mm -hmm. On their interviews, they, again, lies. I mean, you know, ironically, Nolan's telling all sorts of lies. He's telling all sorts of lies when he's like, you know, we, 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 we read all the comics we could and we looked at the rich history of this character when he clearly didn't. Mm -hmm. Like Paul Levitz gave him like six comics or something. So they, you know, they construct, just like George Lucas, they make up these histories of things that they, and they come, they come to believe the way it happened, and I don't think he did. So, so they say that I've been right from the They do, and maybe it's... Kind of like, um, well, who knows how true it is? Who knows how true it is? Partly, I think they are um, obliged by, you know, by press office to say certain things. Partly, to extent, they probably, in, in good faith, they sort of mean it, or if they come to believe it, because they've said it so many times in so many interviews. Who knows? But you can't really trust the documentaries for exactly what happened because they just spin the same sort of publicity line. I'm saying in relation to the idea that um, Goy was more creative influence than Nolan. I, I point to the future Batman films uh, and where no, uh, where Goy wasn't the course on the staff and where writing and screenwriting very much felt to Nolan and Jonathan. Mm -hmm. As evidence that no one's probably more significant influence than Goy was. Though the example of Blade is an interesting one because yeah. another one that came out around the same time yeah. you know, as Spider Man and X when demonstrating graphic novel adaptations mm -hmm. to film that we successful. Yeah. Well, yeah. Goya is a director. He did he not be uninvited recently? Definitely. Did he? Yeah. Goya did quite late, didn't he? Yeah. 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 Director. Right. Oh. Yeah. Uh, well, I just have a question, which sort of comes on your point about the success of the film, but relating the, the relationship between 
Warner Brothers DC and then the kind of internet guys. Yeah. Sort of thing. And just that <clears throat> the the kind of the decreasing sales of comic books yeah. suggesting that these fanboys don't actually carry so much economic mm-hmm. clout. And I'm saying fanboys mm-hmm. like, in a very yeah. gentle way. Yeah. But, um, uh, and yet, and yet, they kind of prove this test bed for, yeah. for these huge corporations that do sure. not really need just people that spend you know, a little bit of their money each month on content. Yeah, that's right. um, and so, how that works, and do you get the point where a certain group of people get a film that they've somehow dictated the trajectory of? So they get given the film they want, and there's, you know, in what way are they actually a sample for the mainstream success of these films, and how convoluted is the relationship between these groups? Of um, it is convoluted, and not in any predictable way. Um, for instance, Scott Pilgrim, the producer, thought it was going to be a surefire hit because it played so well at conventions, and it actually wasn't. Uh, I can't remember exactly how critically well it was received, but it, I don't think it bombed, but it was far less successful than they thought. They thought they had it totally sorted out there, because it played really, really well, and they did it they did exactly how they would, playing to internet groups and so on, and getting more fans on board. And in that case, I think, I'm not sure what it was, maybe the fans, you know, I don't really study production industry that much, but maybe the fan group wasn't enough. Um, it, it's very complicated, and it, I don't think it can be predicted. And I guess the fact that it can't be predicted is, is why some films are hits and some aren't, because obviously, you know, um, is it, was it Disney did John Carter of Mars? Yeah. Yeah. Right, you know, obviously they spent millions trying to see whether there would be a market for John Carter of Mars. And there wasn't, and so, you know, basically a company I would have said don't make John the car of Mars. <laughs> you know, but obviously, they, they, can't, they, can't, they can't predict the market, can they? And obviously they've got a lot of very skilled, very highly paid people trying to predict whether these so are going to see. This, this particular fan demographic can predict the market? Um, no, I think it's right, okay, it's, sorry, to, to get back to answering your question rather than John Carr of Mars. <laughs> um, I haven't even seen it. Because, um, I, th- I think it's true that there aren't, Sales of comics are quite low, but I think the point is that um, comic book fans are vocal, and the comic book fans can influence the broader audience. There's not an awful lot of them, but like I say, they're quite noisy. They're quite a noisy group, um, and that kind of protest can put the broader audience off the film. People who aren't ever going to pick up a comic. So you know, if there's like, um, say, there's going to be a film of um, uh, <coughs> the Blue Beetle or something. So they're going to be a film of Blue. The Blue Beetle, and all comic fans were like the Blue Beetle. This film stinks. It's a total portrayal of the comic. People who don't care about the comic, and there aren't that many people who don't who care about the Blue Beetle um, comic, are still going to be influenced by that general sort of discourse because fan discourse is not really separate anymore. It's all over Twitter and Facebook and so on. So it's going to be an idea. This is a turkey before it even comes out, I think. So even though the Blue Beetle might only sell like ten thousand copies a month, the fans can still give a very bad publicity around the film. But I can't really predict it, and I think if it was predictable, um, they would be sure that the films were going to be hit and they wouldn't be any dust. You get the sense that they're kind of uh, trying to generate subcultural capital by going to these companies. Well, yeah, because this one I find so interesting is that you could yeah. arguably pitch these films away yeah. from the company. Yeah. Them a part of your uh, kind of multiplying the, the adaptation that takes place is, is showing the distance and that you know if if a film if John Carter was kind of if the press releases that went to the mainstream press via press association mm-hmm. said you know what great directorial work yeah. it was what interesting yeah. things it did with cinematography then this stuff you know might yeah. might separate the kind of fan concern from this idea of the kind of I still think that whether someone is a fan or not, I still think that um, the idea of fidelity is very powerful. And I think if the idea is circulated that this is an unfaithful adaptation, I think within the adaptation, if people know it's an adaptation and they know it's not at all faithful to the original, in the eyes of people who like the original, I still think it loses value. If you do like Great Expectations and it's well known, which is coming up, you know, however great that new film is, if it was well known that people who love the novel think this is a terrible, think this is unfaithful and totally different from the book. For some reason it's going to lose value because like people want it to be people want it to be the idea of it's accurate and faithful and goes right back to the source still carries value if people don't care about the source. Does this in some way go against then a general trend of remix culture and of, of copy left and that this, this kind of Yeah, I, still, I, I think the, I think these these values die very hard. 
to quote another film title. Uh, <laughs> a good day to die hard. It's coming out soon. Um, but die then hard, you, die hard just hard. to think that, can you get adaptations like Watchmen that they're too faithful? They don't, it doesn't really work. It's, it tries to replicate the panels overly literally. It's a really kind of lead and lump and fill. So well, yeah, yeah, ironically, I think the criticism that it's too faithful is, is, is quite a niche criticism, actually, mm. just from fans. I think the idea that Watchmen was a totally faithful adaptation of the most important graphic novel of the 20th century is the idea the general public will retain. You know, that even if they haven't read it, most people haven't read Watchmen at all. The idea that this was an important graphic novel, they've heard of it even if you don't read comics. You know, it's one of it was, it was in Time Magazine's top 100 novels of the 20th century and so on. And this is a totally faithful adaptation. I think that still carries value, even for people who couldn't care less about them more. Mm. And I think the idea that, uh, as Bob Rehack says, that it's kind of a very stilted, it's kind of embalmed in its attempt at fidelity, it, it's dead. It's like a, in amber, is actually quite a minority view. It's no, the view of that view at all, eh? I'm so, okay. so, sorry, I understand. Yeah. He's totally wrong. I mean, if you hadn't seen the comic, just briefly, you wouldn't think, well, hey, that frame looks just like that frame in Dave Gibbons drew. Um, no, but you could, it's quite a easily, film. you could I quite easily have seen, you, you might quite easily, even if you're not any kind of comic band fan, because of the way things circulate these days, seeing a link to a page which compares panels from the comic with panels from the film, you might well have an idea, oh, this is shockingly faithful. Because just these days, you go on Facebook and someone has posted up a link, can you believe how faithful this comic is to the this film is to the comic, and so people are, are aware that this is supposed to be, you know, this frame by frame comparison thing I showed the Sin City and Watchmen. Yeah, I don't think that makes it bad. I mean, I don't think that makes it bad. So I, I saw that film, possibly with you, there, and uh, it was, you know, I thought it was absolutely thrilling. No, but on my own, it was absolutely thrilling. Good. Well, we played that down. because the, um, the film made no attempt to broach itself to a wider audience, to so the people that would necessarily become comic book. Is, is that that why that? Um, it gets bad press because it, it makes no attempt to, to go to the, the 50 million people that are actually going to go watch it rather than 100,000 that are going to be Well, I don't think Watchmen did do badly, actually. I, 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 it, I, it did very well, yeah. but, but a lot of people walked away from it with bad taste in their mouth. I don't know. Um, yeah, what well, you mean fans or more general? Well, I, I had heard of the series before I saw oh, okay. the film. Okay. Um, and I felt that it was it was trying to, um, to be about um, the, the the change that um, um, some of them about character, um, those type of characters, mm -hmm. and trying to really exploit that mm -hmm. within a film. I don't think it, it didn't do spectacularly well to it, but neither did it really bomb. It did incredibly well in the Blu-ray releases. Okay. Um, well, my, my personal view of it is that it starts off very well, but then it, you, it, it tries to adapt. 12 issues of the comic into a you know two-hour film, and that's a very hard task. Basically, it tries to I wanted to uh, ask a question <coughs> on the point about uh, the increasing influence of a relatively small but vocal fan community mm. on these kinds of movies. Um, and actually, how in the recent, maybe the last year, but longer than a year, um, that almost seems to be in decline. Um, there was a uh, high profile what, uh, example when the Avengers was about to be released, in which the entire cast came up at Comic Con uh, and it was a huge big deal. And the following Comic Con, a lot of the support that are thrown behind that at Marvel Studios was withdrawn, um, which, after the increase in the amount of exposure and mental influence fans had, was very, very surprising. Yeah. Um, on another broader cultural example, not taken from a graphic novel, but taken from the geek culture. It's, um, it's really quite surprising that um, an intellectual property as well observed and documented and obsessed over as Star Wars should have an announcement that they're going to do a new Star Wars movie without there being any indication of it or any leaks across the internet in the months and months leading up to that process. Mm. And whilst it undermines my hypothesis of the recent occurrence, um, the most recent Star Trek movie, the mm -hmm. J.J. Abrams mm -hmm. uh, reboot, from trailers and promotion, it's younger cast and the way it's presented, almost seems to be embarrassed of this sort of material, in a very similar way to what you were describing in the first Batman. Oh, I don't um, agree with that. Okay, well, I, I was going to, ignoring that one then, but the more recent examples, um, 
I was going to ask, what do you, th do you think that trend will continue? Do you think that that is just an isolated incident and a general increase in the influence of fans on these kind of intellectual properties? And what do you think the impact of that will be in the future? I think with the Avengers, the Avengers did actually pretty better than anyone expected. And I think the thing with the Avengers, if they are now trying to pander less to fans or cater less to fans, I mean comic book fans, mm. that's because the Avengers achieved its own kind of life far bigger than any comic book audience. I mean the Avengers, you know, people, again, people who couldn't care less about comics went to see it. People went to see it because they liked the look of the male stars. People went to see it because they liked Robert Downey Jr. They went because they liked CGI. They went because they liked Regan. It doesn't have to appeal to comic book fans at all anymore. So I think the Avengers, you know, all power to it, I guess, even though I'm not really a Marvel fan, it's, it's, it's achieved something very special there, very unusual. Um, it's become something which can work entirely on its own for your, and you, you don't have to even know it's an adaptation because rather than really being an adaptation of comics, what it is, it's an integration of the previous Avengers films there. So actually, almost rather than an adaptation, it's, um, I think they are going to adapt, um, I know, I'll give you X-Men, they're adapting Days of Future Past, yeah. they are X-Men. So that's a specific story, but the Avengers, as far as I know, is not really adapted to no. any specific tale of the Avengers and the comic. So the Avengers film, um, Avengers Assemble, rather than really being a comic book adaptation, is more a a collection of the strands which were started by the previous stories about the other characters. So to me that's almost more a project which has its roots in film rather than comics now. So the Avengers got its own life. Um, Star Wars, you know, I imagine that was just done behind closed doors because it's like, you know, Disney Lucasfilm financial stuff. Um, but now the announcement's been made, there's leaks all over the place. I mean, now the announcement's been made, it's like, you know, Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, Mark Hamill are going to appear, and who's going to write it, and so on. You know, there's been a writer of sign, isn't there? Who did Toy Story 3? Now rumours are everywhere, so um, I'm, I'm not totally surprised that, you know, Disney and Lucasfilm can carry out stuff without us knowing, because it was all just like money stuff, wasn't it? I mean, now that the character, now that uh, rumours about character and story are starting to emerge, it is, it is all over the place. Um, and the Star, Star Trek, I actually think, was quite, quite affectionate, really, to the original. No, they like, such a young cast and such a sweet... If it has been a bit more in it, um, oh, I, I think it does... I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I do not agree with you that it tries to do the same thing as Batman Begins. It's trying to do with Burton and Schumacher at all. I think, it's, um, I think it's trying to do more what Skyfall does with the previous Bond, which is to integrate the new one in, again, to the same story, to show that this, this, is, this is part of the same storyline. Nolan's Batman is not in any way saying this is the same universe as Schumacher's Batman. But I think Abram's Star Trek is saying this is the same universe, or a slightly alternate one, yeah. to the original Star Trek. And I, I, think it, I think it played pretty well with fans of the original franchise. Just like Skyfall, um, I'm not a big Bond fan, but you know, it's trying to refer back, it's trying to say that this, this Bond exists in the same universe as the Bond that had exploding pens and cars, cars with ejector seats and stuff, yeah. So, is there perhaps another question? Um, <laughs> so, um, I'm not sure. I'll come there's, back to. There's some criticism of the Guardian, I think, um, of the Dark Knight Rises with its um, demonization of the Occupy movement um, through the Bane character and the promotion of this billionaire who comes across and saves everybody, um, identifies um, fascist overtones to what the Batman series. What do you think about that and in comic books generally? Um, I think uh, those people haven't thought about it hard enough, really, because it doesn't demonise the Occupy movement um, at all, in my opinion. For, for I, know, I haven't actually seen the book, so I right. I'm just... Well, they, 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 they probably haven't either, so you know, you're pretty good company there. Um, for various reasons. I mean, Bane's occupation of Gotham City is like the Occupy movement, only in that it's, in terms of the word Occupy, really, it's more of a, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a tyrannical takeover of a city based on, you know, armed, uh, it's an armed invasion. It's nothing like Occupy, it's nothing like a peaceful movement against capitalism at all. And also, about, you know, billionaires got to come and say, because the whole point of Dark Knight Rises, really, is that Batman is imprisoned in his mansion until he loses all his money and has to be thrown out and thrown in the pit just like everyone else has to be in films these days and climb his way up and become a kind of broken man and go back to his origins and, and you know, and literally have his back broken and um, be thrown out of his house, his mansion. 
So by the time that man comes back to save the day, he's not even a billionaire anymore. Literally, he's lost all his money. Um, I think that the, the reason people compare the Bain and Bain's army of, um, of, of terrorists, who are, who are specifically styled and described as terrorists in the film, terrorists and criminals and um, arms dealers and so on, as Occupy, is simply because it looks visually a bit like images of Occupy, and it's people, crowds in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in an urban area, um, filmed in New York, I think, and Chicago, and because it's in the same sort of period. Um, but I, I don't really think there's any particular link between them. Is Batman a fascist? Well, I mean, a billionaire saving people isn't obviously a fascist, I don't think. I mean, he's, he's certainly a capitalist. Uh, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know enough about fascism to identify whether he's a type of fascist, you know. He, he, he certainly believes that his money, entitles, his money and his power entitles him to impose his own form of law and order on other people. And I think his own form of law and order is a very kind of privileged, self-indulgent, bourgeois sense of law and order. He's kind of, you know, he's a, he's a spoiled individualist. His, his power is built on capital, actually. So I don't, fascism, I don't know. But I know that people have accused Miller's um, Dark Knight Returns era of Batman as being fascist. But to be honest with you, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know enough about politics and history to know what they mean by fascism exactly in that context. But it didn't strike me as particularly reminiscent of fascism. I, Batman, to me, is associated with capital. I think that possibly a lot of the um, reading of the Dark Knight Rises as being uh, fascism, or certainly uh, capitalism, um, perhaps more accurately, and a retaliation certainly. to a slight like occupy, um, is based in some of the undertones that run through not just the Dark Knight Rises, but the Dark Knight as well. So much the Dark Knight being about um, the, the, the bad things that have to be done, the unheroic yeah, things that have to be done to fight Tesla, yeah, including, for example, at the end of the film where he taps people's phones yeah. to find out what the Joker is, um, yeah. all of which has the obvious analogy of defending um, invasion of rights yeah. and uh, everything else that one told in retaliation. Yeah, I don't know if I call it fascist. I mean, I think, I think it's certainly parallels that are, are available to be drawn between Batman's behaviour in the Dark Knight and the Bush administration, the Patriot Act, certainly. I think that film is about, um, in simple terms, is it okay to deal with terror through terror? What, you know, is it okay to use the tools of terror in fighting terror? And I think that's a, that's a very good question, but I think the film is also, um, I don't think it comes down to one side, because yes, Batman does uh, introduce a system of surveillance, but then he says to um, Lucius Fox, the one man who hates it the most, I want you to destroy this when I finish the job. We don't see a Bush and Cheney saying we're going to introduce the Patriot Act, but then you know Obama, I trust I, 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 you must destroy this once we've done the job because to, to Bush and Cheney, the job of the war on terror wasn't over. To Batman, the, there, was, there was a finite task. So um, that's something to say. I don't think Dark Knight Rises is like um, you know a pro Obama film either. People can interpret it in various ways from different sides of the red and blue uh, American political. Uh, Spectrum, but I, I do think that Nolan probably cleverly is not coming down on any one side with propaganda cleverly because that would alienate 50% of the paying audience. Um, and I also, with Dark Knight Rises, I do think he was deliberately trying to evoke uh, what were then you know, topical resonant images of Occupy, but I don't think he really does compare to Occupy because Bane's army takes over Gotham City by force because of a sort of personal crusade, really. Yeah. Um, because he turns out to be the bodyguard of, of Talia al Ghul, who, you know, is, is trying to avenge her father. So it's actually not even a political project, really. It's a very personal project. It's a very political blog post, though, which you call Occupy uh, Thugs and Rapists, as I recall. I think it's probably... Yeah, Frank Miller, you know, he's, he's a Nazi. Frank, you know, he is a fascist. <laughs> yeah. he's well, a well, I, I think he's misguided. I mean, you know, Frank, Frank Miller did his... Batman Holy Terror about... He, he, he couldn't call it Batman. He couldn't call it Batman. He called it The Fixer or something. And instead of cat, we're have like the cat or something. Uh, and it's, um, you know, it's a very anti-Islamic sort of Batman analog. I, I don't think we can, um, you know, Frank Miller doesn't represent Batman. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 I think he does. Because he's the author of a lot of the... Yeah, yeah but in, in 1986, yeah. you know, he's, it's a long time since he wrote a good Batman comic, basically. Yeah. 
Do you think it's significant that Christopher Nolan, in the Batman films, he pushes Batman's focus towards organised crime and corruption in the establishment rather than hoodlums? Something that I noticed when I was viewed the three together. Batman, a typical criticism of Batman, he's an establishment figure, his reaction is he just beats up petty thugs who don't know any better. But actually, Chris Nolan specifically lays out Batman's issue is with the corruption in the justice system and organised crime. It's reiterated again and again and again. It's organised crime, wealthy criminals, criminals who could do something else. And it's the, corrupt, the, the justice system is shown specifically to be useless. And that's, I found that, again, like you say, Chris Nolan counterbalances. Every, he seems to have planned out a way of counterbalancing every accusation against mm -hmm. him with a way of tipping the scale back. I'm wondering if you, if you noticed that. I didn't, and it's a very good point. Although, um, in, in, in tackling organised crime, he does also take a lot of hoodlums. Uh, they, might be, they might be employed by Carmen Falcone and so on. But it's he does them. cripple an awful lot of people who are just like petty thugs working for yeah, big gangs. But so. he goes after judges and cops too. Like everyone is, is, is... He is kind of taking down a corrupt system of mafia and... Well, I mean, I think that's probably informed by year one, which is about dead policemen and, and then Long Halloween and Dark Victory, which is about the, the, the mafia families as well. Mm -hmm. um, now, I mean, obviously Nolan was interested in those particular strands, those particular Batman stories for a reason. Um, yes, he is, he is quoting from existing Batman stories, but he could have quoted from other Batman stories. So I think that's a good point, actually. Um, he's not just dealing out random justice yeah. to street folks who are stealing because they're poor. Yeah. It is about organised, corrupt yeah. networks, isn't it? There's a line of dialogue in Batman, and to me it's the defence that I like to rely on. Mm -hmm. I argue that I don't think Chris Nolan is, is a fascist. I think no, it's a little fascist. Bit. And but Batman says, you know, I did travel the world and I lived yeah. as a criminal and I saw what poverty right. yeah. could drive you to. That's and right. I learned that that's, like, right. that's not what I'm going to focus on. So, that's um, point. Um, um, having said that, yeah. I mean, the, the example of what you said, he, this doesn't seem to be anything wrong about a billionaire who spends his money on helping people. Um, even though he makes the efforts to not go after the low level guys, which go after organised criminals, it would seem to be from a broader cultural perspective. What he really wanted to do is change the climate in the city so that the, the socio economic factors might quite go away. Then the effective way to spend his money yeah. would be to donate yeah. to causes yeah. that support yeah. that rather than spending yeah. it on the suit of arm and gadgets. Yeah. Yeah. So the end of the Dark Knight Rises, they dress up and he gives his mansion away. Yeah, at the end of Dark Knight Rises, he actually does what he should have done like eight years ago. <laughs> you know, um, what, 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 what Bruce Wayne, Batman, is actually doing is not trying to fight crime, but trying to make his dead father proud really, and um, avenge his mother. That's what he's trying to do. He's just a kind of rich, traumatised man with a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> if he wanted to change Gotham, seriously, you know, you've got billions, there's lots of ways you can improve Gotham City, which don't involve ordering 10 million there are cows. Yeah. There are cows. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's some other people I think want to ask some questions. Uh, it's just a good one. What did you find that at the last three films, what was the most creative moment? Creative uh, from from Mr. Director. I've, I've got my own personal favorite. I was just wondering what yours was. Like, what's my favorite moment? Uh, favorite mm -hmm. creative moment out of the, the three films. So something. Oh, creating something that isn't in the. Um... Yeah, that, that isn't necessarily part of canon. Um, off the top of my head, because I haven't thought about this, I would I would, I would say um, Joker actually. Not a moment, but I think I think Joker as a character is totally unlike anything we've seen in Batman comics before. Uh, I think it's a brilliant creation, you know, by Ledger and, and Nolan and whoever else is involved in it. And, and also, it, it's, it's heavily, heavily, almost too much, again, influenced the way Joker's portrayed in the comics since 2007. You do not see a Joker now who doesn't have scars on his cheeks. Now. And I mean, that does get a bit boring because something becomes a sort of dominant and they don't do it as well as Ledger and Nolan did. But I think, I think probably that incarnation of Joker is, is possibly Nolan's greatest gift to the mythos. I think it's a brilliant. Mm -hmm. but just to, because uh, I thought the, the particular part that, uh, that he had multiple histories just lies that he was telling him. That was, that was, tr that was truly ingenious because it made the character so much more psychotic. But that's actually from Killing Joke, where he says, if I'm going to have a past, it's going to be multiple choice. Yeah. <laughs> I think the most creative moment was where he went, where are the other jokes going? <laughs> That's probably the best moment of the movie. Another question here. Yeah. So I suppose just start leading up to that. Um, so your book is about 21st century depictions of Batman, right? So I suppose uh, it's mostly about, I mean, that's the subtitle. Yeah, I've got to give a look at the title. 
It's mostly about Nolan's movies and about Grant Morrison's run. So it's mostly sure. about Batman from 2005 onwards, actually. Yeah, I, I suppose what I'm interested in is uh, a lot of your talk was about the yeah, it's about how the film kind of emerged from a very select yeah. group of comics. So I, like, well, I suppose being up what you're just saying about the Joker and how it's changed. Uh, I found I found this uh, yeah, I found this it's quite it's obviously something you can crop up in Marvel. Like if you see if you see uh, Iron Man, yeah. the depictions of him, he's quite clearly he's you know, a picture of the actor who played no, no, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, so I I'd, I'd like to know what both kind of in that sort of literal kind of transmission and in more kind of thematic and kind of more sort of mood based things. What yeah. what shifts have you seen? Is that kind of a normalization? Yes. How extensive is the normalization of um, very <laughs> A comment. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I was calling this the Batman Matrix, and the interesting thing about the Batman Matrix is like it's, it's a two way thing, it's not more than two way, so it, it's a multiple way thing, you know, it's a network. And so just as those texts influence Nolan's, Nolan's text feeds back into the Matrix, just as the Arkham Asylum and Arkham City video games also do, and the Arkham Asylum and Arkham City video games are in turn um, in dialogue with the animated series because even though they look very different, they've got exactly the same vocal talent, I think, some of the same creative talent. Behind them. Um, so, specific terms. Um, well, the depicted Joker has now looks quite a lot like his ledger, and he's got the same just in terms of like the teeth and the smile and the hair and everything. Um, we often see the Tumblr now in comics, the, the Nolan style Batmobile. There are things, there are just things like um, Batman's, Batman's out in quite, quite a subtle way, they can't exactly be pinned down. Um, when Batman returned from traveling through time in um, Bruce Wayne. What was it called again? Sorry. Return of Bruce Wayne? Yeah, Return of Bruce Wayne. When Batman returned then, he's a much bulkier figure with a much more kind of armoured look about him. So there's a lot more kind of look of military hardware than there was in Batman before 2005. Um, in terms of Nolanization, there's, there's an interesting kind of what I would think is a Nolanized penguin. I think it's called, what's it called? Batman Earth One, I think. You know what I mean? That's a good one. It's got, it's, it's got Alfred as a kind of former Marine. Who talks a bit like uh, Michael Caine? But well, I mean, I'm actually him talking. <laughs> I'm actually talking like Michael Caine. Uh, he, he kind of talks in that kind of um, in a sort of gruff Cockney way, and it's got a very interesting penguin actually, who's the sort of penguin, the way Nolan would do penguin. I think it's like not Danny DeVito kind of Dickensian caricature, but uh, he's he's kind of a paedophile businessman or something. Anyway, it's a sort of you know, it's a sort of it's the sort of way you can imagine Nolan doing it. Cause, like, what if penguin was? Um, if we had to put Penguin in a quite realistic universe. Killer Croc um, is no longer, I'm pretty sure he used to look like an actual alligator, now he just looks like a, an African American man with scales in him. So, you know, there's various things. <clears throat> the Nolanization comes across in the, in the um, you know, again, in, in scared quotes, a sort of more realist um, representation. And more kind of militarized and more sort of like, you know, gritty to use all those words again. It's, it's like, it's more sort of real world, but it's not real world, but it's less fantastical and less sort of absurd and less about monsters and more about real people who are monstrous. So there's various examples of the way I think you can see stuff going on now in comics that you wouldn't have seen if no one's films had been successful. Do you think that's economically driven at an editorial level, but there's, yeah. there's a hugely successful film franchise, how do we hope to bring some of those people into the comics? Well, yeah, I actually do. Realism. I do, and I think, I, I think less specifically it's also sort of about branding and coherence. That, you know, there's a sort of, this is how Batman looks these days, I'm going to go on with that trend. I mean, there's various examples of how that was done in a very kind of pragmatic economic sense. Uh, in the late 1960s, the Batman TV show had been based on the comics at the time, but the comics became more like the TV show. They became much more of the um, special effects words. They became, I mean, they've been, the, the TV show had, had been inspired by the comics in terms of its lighting and so on and its performance. But then the comics became even more sort of flat and stylized, even more pop art. And um, and they had go-go checks on them to kind of cash in on whatever was <laughs> why they had go-go checks. But they were certainly trying, they were trying to promote themselves as this is the comic of the TV show. Um, when the very bad Danny Cannon Judge Dredd film came out in 1995, they relaunched Judge Dredd as Judge Dredd Lawman of the Future, wearing the helmet that um, Stallone had worn in the film. So to an extent it's like they're trying to relaunch and bring in that audience, but to an extent I think it's just like a sense of you don't want to confuse the potential audience by making this look radically different from the one they know from that thing. So if they're going to come to an Iron Man comic because they like Robert Downey Jr., 
we better make him look kind of like the one, or else they might not look a little confused. Brandy. Is there any of you? There's one more question. Check one, This could be the last one. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it, I'll leave your brother to... No, no, go, go ahead, thank you. Sure. Um, my brother can ask me questions like I get away. I was going to talk about the EU Commission's um, site presentation about adaptation um, and how you don't see examples in the Nolan movies or in most comic book movies yeah. of adapting specific issues no. or volumes or story lines. Um, but it seems that there are um, other media that do precisely that. Um, yeah. There have been quite recently novelizations of particular graphic novel story lines, like mm -hmm. Marvel and Lisa. Um, there are video games, uh, such as Marvel Ultimate Alliance, which do a lot of things of adapting mm -hmm. uh, the Civil War story, I think, not video really? games, and some mm -hmm. others. Um, and even recently, there have been movies. Um, there have been animated movies, mm -hmm. Batman, in fact, um, adapting specific story lines, like, um, yes, well, like Superman Doomsday. Yeah. Um, and I think Marvel are doing the same, trying to help with adaptation of uh, Marvel existing stories. Well, there's an animated film of um, Dark Knight Returns in year one, yeah. recently, isn't it? Yeah. So, I was going to say, um, where does that um, fit into the usual matrix of not adapting yeah. films, not adapting particular issues? I think they're more niche, aren't they? They're mm -hmm. more for a comic audience. Yeah. I mean, I think those things are pretty much straight to DVD. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's going to be comic book fans who buy an adaptation of Frank Miller's Year One, adaptation of Dark Knight Returns. Well, I'd be interested to see. I, I don't know anything about like the, the sales of those versus the sales of comics. Um, I, I, I don't know if they do pay for the to a comic book. Yeah, well, well, I'm pretty sure that it's, it's, it's smaller sales than Dark Knight Rises. Right? So sure. That yeah. I mean, and so that's where I think it falls. Yeah. Somewhere in between. Uh, probably it's a, it's a clever way of. Um, Dealing with the fact that comics don't sell an awful lot, but maybe DVDs based on a comic from the 80s will sell more. So I think it's probably a middle ground, just like that Gotham Knights. It's, 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 Gotham Knights is not going to sell as much as the DVD of Batman Begins, but it's going to sell to people who like Batman comic book and some people who like Batman Begins. So, you know, it just falls in a different place on the, on the network of, of intertexts. I mean, you're absolutely right, there, um, there are, yeah, there certainly are examples of things which are trying to adapt to a specific story. Um, but I think. I think they don't tend to be the big mainstream, massive budget, tentpole, you know, big CGI and summer blockbuster. Do you think it could be? Do I think they could be? I spoke earlier about the future of the franchise in Civil War, for example, which is, if you know nothing about Marvel, there's a chance to play Civil War. I don't know, I mean, you bring out a film called Marvel Civil War, and like, it's going to confuse a lot of people. Mm. You know, you bring out Avengers Assemble, people kind of know that. It's those characters we knew from the previous film. It's going to be funny because we've got that fit guy and that fit guy and some big effects. They're all going to be together. It's going to be funny to see Iron Man and Captain America and, and, and Hulk is going to do that with Loki. You know, it's like that. Everyone can understand that. You say Civil War, which side is Spider Man on, which side is Captain America on? Who cares? Most people don't. So I, I, think, I, I think the things that might interest me and you are not interesting to a lot of people. That's the answer. And, yeah, I would see it, yeah. but I'm not most people. But then again, Days of Future Past, so... Surprises me. Yeah. Surprises me. But Days of Future Past is the latest instalment in, in an already fairly successful franchise. Although X3, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, what... X3, I think, didn't do as well as the first two. Yeah. I don't know what they're trying to do with Days of Future Past. Mm -hmm. If they do that, that, that will be an interesting example of a specific um, fan-favourite story successfully adapted into a mainstream film. But I don't think we see a lot of that. I doubt, they be, I doubt very much, let me put it this way, I doubt very much it can be called X-Men 4, Days of Future Past. Right. It's not, because no one's going to care about that half a million and you and like everyone else in this room, but it's not, <laughs> well, some people in this room. But most, seriously, most people who read Total Film or something, or, you know, Silent Sound or The Guardian or anything, Days of Future Past just sounds too geekish, doesn't it? No one's going to see it. It would just be called, you know, X-Men 4, wouldn't it? Face the future. Yeah, yeah. can I yeah. ask a general question? Uh, um, really standing back from it, this is contemporary fiction seminar that you know that's been, you've run many editions and uh, on things like the, the novel, short stories, um, comic books. Um, you know, you're going to do video games, etc., etc. Um, and I wonder where this fits with contemporary fiction or what this. 
tells us as an example of a contemporary fiction, what kind of contemporary fiction it is. But obviously it's different from the literary novel. It's even different from China Miedo, but it is a big, important fiction of some kind in the contemporary. It's more pervasive and uh, influential than most, you know? So I, I wonder what, um, what kind of conclusions about we can draw about what kind of a, a fiction it is. I mean, one, one maybe a couple, couple of thoughts. One is that, um, uh, you know, the superhero is a, is a particular kind of genre that still seems to have some power, at least at the cinema, if not at that as well. Another is that, um, Bat as you said, Batman is, is very, is quite old now, 73 years very so old. Really? It's yeah. funny how this is actually a very long, old story that we really draw on, even though it's kind of modern. It's really kind of heritage, isn't it? And look, the third thing that really this presentation brought out, maybe we can talk about, is um, it's so much of this is about intertextuality and multiple yeah. platforms, isn't it? Yeah. And in literary studies, that's something we're not very used to, you know. Maybe now people say, oh, I've got the MQ and I've also got, the, got it on my mobile phone or something. But, uh, you know, the, the version on the, uh, you know, on the yeah. Kindle. But um, this, you know, the way you're moving between these yeah. media is a different way of thinking about fiction, a contemporary fiction. Yeah. You have any thoughts on uh, I've got a thought about it in a second. I thought you'd thrown open the room kind of thing. Something to say about is Batman an old story, I think is a very interesting point, and I think it's become more and more apparent that you know, Batman's origins, Batman's origin story appeared in 1940. The fact that a, a rich couple would take their 10-year-old son to the cinema in a bad area of town is actually not even plausible anymore. Now, and in 10 and 20 years' time, who's going to believe that Bruce Wayne was orphaned because his parents decided to go to the cinema, particularly to see a Zorro film, and in Nolan's film, they went to see Deflated Mouse, which is more, more kind of plausible. In Burton's film, oh, I'm no, sorry, Burton's film, we don't actually see it. It's a, it's a scene of some, it's not, we think it's a flashback, it's a fake out. Uh, but it is parents taking their kids to the cinema. So Batman's very origin is very sort of 1930s, actually. This, and not to mention the fact that his origin is all based in kind of, the whole thing about crime families is very 1930s. Mm -hmm. I mean, Batman was created not long after, you know, we had Scarface, Little Caesar, and The Public Enemy. It's all that period. It's the Warner Brothers crime drama. For how long is the idea of the Matthew family going to remain remotely plausible? And can Batman survive without that? Because Penguin's are kind of, you know, gangster, isn't it? Joker, they managed to update into a, into a terrorist. I say they've done a new version of Penguin in, in, in Batman Earth 1, which, is, which seems to work. Um, the very idea of going to cinema is sort of dated. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, so Batman's very origins are sort of wrapped up in, in a very early, early-ish, 20th century technology and experience of the cinema, because it's not like if they just stayed in order to Blu-ray, they wouldn't be killed, so <laughs> we wouldn't have Batman. So um, I think it is interesting, I think Batman is actually, even though my title is 21st century Batman, Batman is a very uh, 20th century character, actually. Um, so that would be interesting to see what happens. It is an old story. If we think this is a story that came out when coming out for air came out, and, and we're still looking at versions of it. It's remarkable, actually. And I do wonder, will it have to change? You see that Batman of the future, Batman and Beyond, and so on, which are different, Terry McGuinness and so on. Um, is, is the story of Bruce Wayne as Batman going to remain relevant and resonant to people in a few decades' time? I don't know. I think it maybe is a 20, very 20th century story. But, I mean, in that sense, it may be part of the appeal is its uh, kind of reconfiguration of history. So I was thinking when you were talking about the noirish aspect yeah. of all these runs that are, are kind of enjoying success as adaptations of the cinema, and that in some way there is a there is a kind of speaking to and from mm -hmm. film mm -hmm. and the comic, and, and obviously they're separate mm -hmm. media, so media. But um, that yeah, there's a noirish aspect to these comics, which then make very successful films and. and Mm. We are a culture that still has your godfather sitting at the top of film lists. That still, you know, yeah. it's on TV kind of continually, um, and that that part of the contemporariness of this is its folding together of kind of genre, mm. of particular historical movements, uh, and and this that like, remix isn't quite the right word, but it, it is that coming together, and, and that's the, to me that speaks to. A contemporary moment that, that really embraces mm. that 
intertextuality that messes mm. with historical timelines. So there seems to be adaptations that have embraced that, um, especially the noir return, um, the Batman animated series, yeah. or the televisions are black and white, or the gangsters are totally yeah. different. It's true, isn't it? Um, yeah, there is something quite nostalgic about even Nolan's Batman. I mean, Nolan's Batman, you know, Dark Knight and so on, is really um, influenced and inspired by, I think, crime dramas of the 70s, like uh, Dog Day Afternoon and Serpico and so on, and then Godfather. So, right, it doesn't go back right to the 30s, but there is something sort of retro about it. Um, I see what you're saying, I, I think it still works now. But I wonder if, if those references will become I think less relevant. Cinema is always going to be able to be referenced really? in film. I don't know. The answer's mm. I don't know. Is, I don't know if cinema. I don't know if, if if cinema is going to become a relevant sort of symbol of experience in twenty years time. It might not be a relevant symbol of experience, but it will be a nod to something. Like it, it, it might be emptied out of the but the, signif the signification it has now. But it will still. I mean. The technology, you will still trace back the history mm. of these technologies, technologies remediate other mm. technologies. It's not, mm. it's not going to disappear from the timeline mm. of visual technologies. No, but things don't disappear from the timeline of visual technologies. But I mean, you know, if I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here, you know, teach and have experience with like 18 year olds and then think that, um, you know, anything before 1980 is a really old film. So, you know, I think, I think things start to fade from um, what people consider to be culturally relevant or. Or interesting. I agree that cinema has always been part of kind of visual history. Uh, whether noir is still going to be a like resonant visual style 100 years after the first, like in, you know, in 2041 or something, is, is a question I can't answer. But it's an interesting question. Noir has been a very, very powerful style, hasn't it, throughout the 20th and the um, and the early 21st centuries. But um, you know. And obviously, noir didn't start that, you know, you could do questions and so on before that. Whether that kind of style is still going to have any sort of power and relevance and interest to people in 20 years, I don't know. You're optimistic, I don't know. The five key elements of Batman you identify in your first book, they just seem to translate across the decades, though. You, you ask the question, what would the man in the street know about Batman? You sum it up on five well, Don't quote my own book at me, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's Bruce Wayne, he's you remember rich, better than me, he lives I? in the Batcave, yeah, he fights crime. Okay. That isn't decade specific, it hasn't been proven to be yet. <laughs> Really? No. Um, no, I wasn't saying. I was. Oh, okay. I was sort of saying, will Batman still be relevant? But I wasn't really saying that. I was saying more specifically, will Batman's origin become so dated that it'll have to change the origin? And I was also saying he does seem to have his roots in quite a specific cultural experience, which I don't think is 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 a forever sort of experience, um, because I think it is the experience of the American city. Mm. You know, it started in 1930 or so. Um, no, you're right. The idea. And it's a, good, it's a good point you raised there, um, quoting me. The idea that Batman is a, is a normal man without powers who fights crime because his parents were killed. That's mythic. You're right, you can keep that kernel. Um, I was just saying there are some aspects of the Batman myth, like the fact that his parents, sort of secondary aspects, you yeah. know, that his parents were killed because they went to the cinema to see a Zorro film. That sort of thing might have to change. And Nolan, Nolan has shown that it can change because they go to the opera and see the Fledermans, so you know. And his story still sort of works, doesn't it? it what is it in the origin? Then? It's Zorro. Um, I, I don't think it was originally Zorro, but it sort of becomes Zorro because it was. Then, it, then Zorro was mentioned. And the, what happens in continuity is, you know, the story is told and the story is retold, and some elements in the retelling catch on and remain, and some don't. And now it's part of the origin as well because it's been repeated a couple of times. So the week before they went to see Zorro, they went to see Bambi, and Bruce cried. And was taken out mm. of the cinema, and that's, I guess, why he stayed in the film during Zorro, and that's why his parents died. So, you know, the, the story becomes established through being told a number of times, and certain elements repeat, basically, that's, so now it's the mask of Zorro, it's generally established that it's the mask of Zorro. Can I just come back again to ask my last question again, maybe Tony or Zara, you know, might have a take on it, about this multi-platform thing, about how that affects our sense of fiction, and it's because it's challenging compared to, like I say, the novel, we don't think of it that way, but this has shown fiction across all these media, and sort of having different, you know, remediation or whatever you want. Well, I don't think it depends on what kind of novel you read. You speak, if you speak about some, there are science fiction and fantasy series that they, they're, you know, in lots of volumes and they extend over games, so 
there's a lot of that kind of transmedia mm -hmm. stuff that's going on in prose fiction. In genre fiction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess part of the, uh, the mission statement for this seminar is mainly to um, piss off Robert Eagleston, who likes to purify things and keep literary fiction completely separate from anything else. Mm -hmm. I don't think either of us really think that. It's one of the things we had in starting this, and we were recently putting together a course proposal, which is about contemporary fiction, and the same thing, that I don't know if the, you know, we were struggling over the word narrative and over the word yeah. fiction and how you bring in a kind of interdisciplinary scholarship, which, although it needs to respect media specificity, doesn't necessarily have to, it doesn't need to be interdisciplinary. Uh, if we were at Birkbeck and in the, amongst the PhD students there, there's very few people that could claim to be solely producing a, a PhD on literature that doesn't include uh, in kind of modern or contemporary, uh, some form of other media, or that doesn't reference journalism, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, and this breaks down the minute you get to research in something like an English department. Um, and so, yeah, I don't. Fiction isn't always the right term. Oh no, I'm not saying it's not. I think it is. You know, yeah. it is. In fact, that is. Yeah. It's not interesting to look. But yeah, the, the point of the term fiction was to encompass that and to be able to hold a seminar series that didn't have to. About trans, transmedia, uh, yeah. I was just thinking about it. I mean, I think the general rule is that the more popular something is, the more transmedia is, and the more literary it is, uh, the less transmedia it is. Um, but then again, I was thinking, like, you know, I was on the tube and you see an advert, you know, Simon Callow doing whatever he's doing, Christmas Carol or something. You know, stage, stage versions, contemporary stage articulations of Dickens. Um, the way Dickens appears practice, and things like Doctor Who. When you think about like, the zombie mashup of Yeah, mm -hmm. things like that. Like I say, Sorry, that's like an idea of Doctor Who. <laughs> so I'm in that bucket. You know, Doctor Who and, and, and Dickens and Shakespeare in, in Doctor Who. Um, yes, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and so on. Um, heritage locations, and I'm sure there's some, I'm not interested, I'm not involved in this myself, but I'm sure there are people who dress up in Jane Austen. I'm sure there's Jane Austen cosplay and stuff like that. Um, there's, certainly, there's certainly Jane Austen tourism where you can go to a place and become immersed in. And there's certainly, as we saw, um, you can buy the soundtrack of a particular version of Pride and Prejudice. There's many, many different versions of the novel. Again, I don't know, you know, there are the comic book versions. I, I don't know, as far as I know, video games of Pride and Prejudice, but you know. From the classic illustrator. Yes, yes, no doubt, but it was Marvel classic illustrator. So I, th I think with, with, with a lot of texts, we can find um, transmedia uh, incarnations. We'd have to look further. If you think about something like Cloud Atlas, there's probably only two versions of that. There's no other film and novel. But perhaps that's because it's not been going so long. Perhaps in 60 years, you know, we'll see a different versions. I mean, Batman, to, I think the comparison of coming out with Ferrer was fair, because that has been around pretty much exactly the same period. But um, Batman is partly like an encyclopedia of Batman because it's been around for so long. Uh, by 1943, it was just two comics and a, um, a film serial. And maybe a couple of spin offs, you know, but it wasn't nearly as big 70 years ago. Oh, one more, one more question. I'm flat with yeah. questions, obviously. I'll ask you. You're right, you uh, Will Steele, I would say. Is it even still allowed to ask a question? <laughs> Just a quick question about the kind of the origins and the myth of Batman. He seems to be like begging to like American culture in the same way as, well, probably a lot more popular than Hannibal. I mean, Hannibal Lecter came out as this like serial killer. I mean, there was a, mm. I've read a book and there was like, two major figures mm. in American culture. One was Ronald Reagan, and the other one was Hannibal Lecter. Right. And then, <laughs> and then eventually, <laughs> you know, you, you learn about um, Hannibal's childhood, yeah, and how he murdered. I mean, would, would they go back to um, possibly uh, presenting Batman films from his earlier period of his life? Because I, I don't know that much I would say. Um, there are some stories that are about Bruce Wayne's childhood. Um, not all that many. Hush, Jeff Logan, Jim Lee's Hush talks about his, his friend Tommy or whatever, isn't it? His friend Tommy from Thomas Australia. Hallier. What's his name? Thomas Hallier. Thomas Hallier, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, Grant Morrison's Gothic is about a, a teacher called Mr. Whisper or something, a bunch of this, some of you probably remember his name. It's about Bruce Wayne at school. So there are stories which go back into his childhood, yeah, and not all that many in my experience. I guess for the reason that he's interesting once he becomes Batman, isn't he? I mean, Bruce Wayne is a boy, he's like little, little form of boy, he's a, he's a spoiled boy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Hannibal was a son of immigrants and was his parents, I think, were, I remember correctly. His sister was Betty Teeth or something or other. 
very He was nice racing Paris. Yeah, well, there you go. He's mm -hmm. on Paris. Um, interesting how he becomes Hannibal and how he, even after he becomes Hannibal in the second film, I think, um, is it Red Dragon? Uh, uh, Signs of the Land is sort of the second film, I think. Yeah, it depends if we're talking chronological or on. Not Manhunter, that was the first one. Well, what you've got is Manhunter, Silence of the Land, yeah. Red Dragon, Hannibal Rising or something, and Hannibal yeah. Anyway. But um, look, the thing about Origins I think is interesting. Uh, I think our. I, 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 my answer to that would be I think it is interesting our apparent cultural need to find psychological origins for things, which is evident in the James Bond film Skyfall, which for the first time, as far as I'm aware, tells us why, why James Bond is such a hard guy. Because, you know, his parents died and he hid in a a hole in the house, which is just like, <laughs> okay, but it's not like, it's not really an origin sequence, it's just like, for some reason we have to see, like, you know, what, James, what made James Bond a hard-ass character, uh, in, in this kind of Nolanized way, we have to have some idea about little James Bond and his, his parents. Well, the audience is in the 70s interested in that, you know, is it just that we become, as a culture, you know, we, you know we're just not tripped that easily by Slappy pennies and ah. Well, it certainly seems that superhero movies come out recently. It's mandatory that the first film will be an origin story. Yeah. In a way that was never the case for James Bond. That was never I'd the case for Indiana Jones. I'll tell you why I think it might be with James Bond because that film is self-consciously about history. Because it's like fifty years of James Bond or whatever, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's very self-consciously about the archive of James Bond's stories, and that is what I think. It's about James Bond getting older. And is he a you know old dog new tricks and so on? The old methods are the best and so on, as he says. So I think the reason, if that is the first film that suggests anything about young James Bond, I don't know having said that, didn't Charlie Eaton write young James Bond stories? Mm -hmm. So there are other, just like this young Sherlock Holmes, we did have this interest in what made them the way they are, don't we? Young Indiana, young Indiana yeah, Jones, yeah, yeah. Yeah. that as well. Uh, if you want me to give an answer to that, I would say it's probably um, the influence of kind of like uh, popular Freudianism, you know, what made this person the way they are in their childhood, probably, is why we're doing that. And the reason it tops across up with Skyfall is because Skyfall is about history and about where Bond came from as a franchise and about the previous films, just like it's about the Aston Martin and the classic theme tune and so on. And it's also because Nolan's Batman is popular and they're trying to do what Nolan's Batman did with Batman with Bond. So there's a whole number of reasons. Thank our guest. Yeah, I'll do it.